to what extent do you think since um, the, the roaring 60s or the rebellious 60s or, or um, the post-conciliar Catholic world, has there been a, a diminution, a, a reduction in that obedience to the papacy, I guess an anti-papist um, underground within the church, or not even an underground so much, and specifically, uh, to what extent has the media fueled that and how damaging has it been? I, I think, uh, uh, first of all, yes, I think there's been a, a huge amount of uh, evil uh, present in those particular things. Uh, real presence, uh, you know, in the United States, roughly 20% of Catholics go to Mass, which means 80% don't. Uh, over here, I think you're around 15%, right? Less. Less. Well, you don't want to, you don't want to overtake us in that statistic. Um, so, I mean, I mean, that is, it's an unbelief in the real presence and in some cases it may be a rejection of the real presence. You can't really know because the catechesis has been so horrible in the Western world you don't know if somebody has been taught this is the real presence of our blessed Lord, body, blood, soul, and divinity, uh, or they just never heard it. You don't know. I think as time moves on here I think it probably is more likely that they've just never heard this. And I can relate a story with uh, Charlie, our cameraman, who's not at the camera, but back at the food table. <laughs> <laughs> Who, by the way, just got married a weekend, two weekends ago. <laughs> Don't ask about the honeymoon, it's been dreadful. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, uh, uh, when Charlie came to work with us four years ago, he'd been an altar boy. Uh, at his parish, uh, you know, as well, and he sit, sat down to start editing, fixing some edits on the fourth season of The One True Faith, which is 13 episodes, one hour each, all about the real presence. We dedicated the entire season to the real presence. And at some point during the edit, he turns around to the guys in editing and he goes, do we really believe this? What, that's God? And he was an altar boy. So, you know, in... Charlie's case then, could you say he rejected the real presence? No, because he'd never, he didn't know there was something to reject. But through horrible catechesis, he was simply unaware of it, so he had no belief in it. And I think that's a distinction that we need to make, uh, which is why any evangelization effort has to happen first inside the church. The church looks like Berlin 1945 right now. And uh, it needs to these things need to be talked about with people we know, people we love, our family members. All of that must happen. Our friends at school, all of this must happen. <clears throat> with regard to Our Lady, there is absolutely no doubt in the rush to embrace uh, uh, Protestantism, Protestants, uh, that uh, many, many, many people in the church were perfectly happy to go tell mom to sit down and be quiet. And uh, that has, I think, the combination of that and the real presence, sort of relating back to Don Bosco's vision, uh, has really been responsible for the lack of support and faith in the institution of the papacy and the love of the Holy Father. When you kind of throw out God and his mother or marginalize them, anything that they have given us will necessarily get thrown out too. Uh, so yeah, and the media is, the media isn't complicit so much in the idea of sitting around trying to say, I mean, you know, we never sat around in newsrooms at CBS going, let's figure out how to undermine the Catholic Church's teaching on the, the perpetual virginity of Mary. And it's not just a question of the news media on this level, it's a question of the media on the entertainment level. So much stuff is just flashed at us all the time that what's being flashed at us is so contrary to uh, you know, the, the, the purity of Our Lady, uh, the divinity of Our Lord, it's just very earthly, it's very grinding. And when you think about even good Catholics who make an effort to not expose themselves to these things. 
Think how many times you just happen to put on a radio, you're driving down the road, there's a billboard, uh, you walk into a store, there's a magazine. You think about the number of times you get blasted, even when you're trying deliberately and consciously to avoid it, and you're still getting blasted with it. What about those 80, 85 percent of our Catholic brothers and sisters that don't go to Mass who the thought never occurs to them that they should try to avoid these things? They're washed over like a tsunami. Uh, so this is why any evangelization effort has to begin inside the church with fallen away Catholics, lapsed Catholics, ignorant Catholics, uneducated Catholics. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, um, yeah, anyone with questions, put in up. Michael, is there any chance of some Australian content uh, of um, church news? Uh, on, your, on your daily program or a weekly program. At the moment, we're assailed by a, um, an organisation uh, that masquerades as a church in, in our country with so-called news, and uh, it, it's just not worthy of, um, of any of us. So can we have some Australian news content in your program? I, I, I think we'd be happy to manage that. Uh, matter of fact, uh, Ronan, that can be something you and I talk about. Uh, I just need to get it to us. Uh, it's wonderful coming to all of the different places coming here because all of a sudden you're like, oh, now I'm hearing everything the way it really is <laughs> on the ground. And oftentimes in a, a kind of formal church establishment run media things, outfits, usually print, some things you go, hmm, that doesn't seem to add up. If everything's so great, why do 85% of Catholics not go to Mass? So, uh, you know, you see the things, all your kind of, in, in my case, my kind of journalistic hunches kick in and go, hmm, something's not right about this scene. I don't know what it is, but um, if, uh, I, I'm very happy to receive, uh, you know, news on the ground. Just send it to us at Church Militant TV and click on, just go onto the website and there's an info. Just say, you know, hey, this is for Mike. It's from Australia. It's a news piece. Just send the link or write the note or whatever it is. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's one of the things I actually want to do. We're just, you know, we have 20 people that work for us at the studio in Detroit. And uh, all of them, as Charlie will attest to, massively underpaid. Uh, but uh, uh, very dedicated. And one of the things I want to be able to do is kind of open up the newscasts a little bit more. Uh, specifically with themes uh, instead of just doing hey this happened in you know France and here's two things that happened in France or, or France I guess right uh, <laughs> uh, and the same things happened in Perth uh, <laughs> I'd, <laughs> I'd like to pick up themes uh, that you know here you know this has happened and then this has also happened here here and here because one of the things I see uh, and Charlie and I comment on a lot, and Charlie generally comes with me, although now Mrs. Charlie will be forbidding that for uh, frequency. But for the last three years, Charlie and I have really done a lot of the traveling, and we talk all the time. You see the same things all over the world, the same problems, the same issues, the same challenges, uh, even in a different culture where you think, hmm, that really shouldn't be happening there. It's a different culture, and you go, huh. This is the diabolical because it's so glaringly, it's the same attacks, it's the same thing. Uh, uh, for example, um, how many of you here have uh, two or more uh, relatives or loved ones who no longer practice the faith? Keep your hands up. Now turn around and look. All over the world, that's the exact same response. For that worldwide falling away from the faith, there is only one, you know, uh, SOB that's responsible for that. So, uh, yeah, anything that helps continue to frame the story, put it in context, I am very happy to receive. Send me anything you want. Absolutely. Thank you, Father. Do you have any other questions? Okay. Sister, are you... Oh, she just made me see. Uh -huh. <laughs>
just on that last point you made there, um, we had uh, Luna in our parish, uh, went for three or four years, without uh, any uh, argument whatsoever, the number of people that put in requests for their family to return to the church was extraordinary. I think it was something like 90% of the petitions we got in the, par in the parish was for that very petition. The other thing that I'd like to mention is that uh, we've fallen away so dramatically in the last few years with contraception, abortion, uh, gay marriage, homosexual unions. Uh, the next one that I see is embryonic stem cells just going beyond all realms of reality. Uh, do you feel that is, that is the absolute downfall we're, we're going to face as the, the ultimate downfall? I think in, uh, with regard to that, in, uh, certainly in the United States, we already have that. Embryonic stem cell research got across the finish line before same-sex marriage did. But uh, I, the whole crux of this goes back to contraception. All of it goes back to contraception. And as Catholics, I think we have to just admit the genie is out of the bottle. There's no way to get that back in on an earthly level. Too much, you know, human nature kind of left to itself because of concupiscence uh, uh, will always spiral downward. Just it's the nature of the beast. Uh, the role of the church is to prevent that from happening and to lift it up through pain, struggle, suffering, mastery, self-discipline, da 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 da. When the church isn't there doing that, which it really hasn't been, the, the, the institutional church has not been concerned about these things. Uh, in New York, Cardinal Timothy Dolan gave a, uh, uh, an interview to the Wall Street Journal about a year ago, and he flat out admitted, and he included him, he made a point of saying, and I'm including myself, you know, we didn't do what we should have done. We just got gun shy on all these sex issues and they were hot button and if you said something, people would blow up so we just shut up and didn't do anything. And he included himself in that, which I suppose he should have. And uh, now we have the effects of that. And what we have now is a culture falling apart that will necessarily have to fall apart. Can you imagine that all of a sudden there would be this mass rush of people saying, oh yes, I know I've run around and had sex with whoever I wanted to as frequently as I wanted to whenever and whoever and whatever gender and however many times, but now I want to be celibate and live by the teachings of the church. It's not going to happen. It'll happen individually here and there. It happened in my case, but not all of that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but a bunch of it. Um, uh, but the church isn't even saying anything even today. And when I mean the church, I don't mean the magisterium and the teachings, I mean the people who are charged with saying these, they're not doing it today. So uh, that embryonic stem cell research is just another violation of human life. It's just another one. But you look at the list of these and you think, well, how many, how absolutely, totally screwed up can the world become? Uh, it's a question. It's, I think, what... I'm really concerned about just how far is the embryonic stem cell. These crazy people like Gosnell have been reading about them. Sure. Some of these physicists are just so out of this world that they can do anything with the, with the embryo. Yeah, well, it's, again, it's diabolical. Anything that strikes at the core of human life and human nature and turning it kind of upside down and twisting it around is all diabolical. And uh, there is only one institution, there's only one community on the earth that can successfully oppose, defeat the diabolical, and that's the Catholic Church. And if it doesn't step up, the world goes to hell. Isolated pockets here and there are able to be saved and form communities and you know rely on each other and that's where we are right now. That's where we are. I went back to uh, back to Detroit in January of last year after having been in Nigeria, 
and uh, Charlie and I were over there touring around the country. We actually went to the site that on the previous Christmas of 2011, a uh, car bomb had gone off and, uh, outside of a Catholic church, St. Teresa's in Abuja, on uh, Christmas and killed 47 people in the parish. And uh, it was very sobering to be there. Um, and we were, uh, and, and while I was there, we started doing Vortex. We were there for a while. We posted, I don't know, five or six or something. And after the second or third one, all of a sudden, I get a phone call. I'm not sure how I got my phone number, but I get a phone call from this priest in New Jersey. And he says, oh, I know where you're standing. You're standing in Patrick O'Kay's yard. I'm like, yeah, that, that's where we shot that. How did you know that? He goes, oh, I know that because blah, blah, blah. By the way, you know, his daughter's in London. And, the, and all of a sudden, I'm, I came back and I said to my father, I walked in and I was kind of bummed out. And I said to my dad, you know what, dad? There is no bastion of the faith anywhere. There is no, here it is, you know, you know the church high on the hill. When you start putting videos out, that people on the other side of the world can look at, watch, realize, and all of a sudden start pinpointing it, and they know who you're with, and that guy knows their friends. You've done the circuit now. I don't know, obviously there's people we don't know yet, but when you start getting that kind of overlap, you're like, you know, there is no bastion of the faith. The faith is represented in these little small communities all over the world exactly like Pope Benedict said before he was elected, but he said that in his book, uh, Light of the World, uh, and he reiterated again after he became Pope Benedict. Uh, and to that end, you guys have to realize that's the reality. And we can't be sort of looking back, thinking in these nostalgic terms of, you know, we can restore the glory of the church and it'll become the state religion. And uh, all these, you know, you know, those days were gone when they chopped off French priests and nuns' heads on the guillotine. That was over. Uh, so what, where we are today in the faith is having to look forward to... The, the world is transitioning to something else. What it's transitioning to... You know, it's not good. What form it will take, what government it will take, all of that, you know, who knows. But the eternal church must remain in this. And what we have been given in this time and place is the charge to make sure that we bring that into whatever this next phase of the world is. So is that challenging? Yeah. Is it daunting? Most definitely. But is it a great blessing and a great grace to have been chosen to do this? Yeah, it is. Where we get to represent Christ in the midst of the storm. This is our road to sanctity. This is our individual road to heaven. From all eternity, our Lord knew he would create each one of us and put us in this circumstance. We really do get to this. It's one thing to have a lighthouse sitting out there on the, you know, on the breakers uh, in the middle of the day. And you see it, it's nice, there it is, you don't really pay attention to it. Ah, but when the storm comes and it's nighttime and it's rough seas, now that light takes on a whole different level of attraction. And that's where we are today right now, in the midst of all of these things. We have to learn the faith not just know that the church says this is bad and this is good, but why? What is the, the church's teachings come out of the love of God for mankind. That's what they are. They are the concretized expression of his love for us. We need to study these things, understand these things, and be able to communicate them on that level to people. And if we think in terms of, uh, you know, throwing the towel. Yeah, you can throw in the towel on the past. It's over. There is no more Father Bing Crosby. There is no more, you know, Sister, you know, Ingrid Bergman. All that stuff's gone. No Father O'Malley. But we get to be used by our Lord. If we say, use me, he will. We get to be used by our Lord to help 
refashion, to help rebuild whatever's going, because this is all going to fall apart. This is gone. This is gone. It may not happen for 100 years. It may happen in 10 years that we could be marched off to some kind of camps or detainment centers or detention centers or anything? I mean, absolutely. Absolutely. Once the homosexual agenda becomes enshrined in law, oh, now it's all bets are off. If somebody wants to rent a church hall, you know, lesbian wives or whatever the madness is called, want to rent a church hall, or they want to come work here uh, in the church. The church has to say, no, I'm sorry, you can't. Ah, well now if it's a constitutional right versus a religious right, what happens when the government says, no, I'm sorry, their constitutional right to have sex with each other is more important than your constitutional right to say, uh, uh, no, it violates your religious principles. What do you do then? This is already happening in the United States. Adoption. Three places, the Archdiocese of San Francisco, <laughs> of all places, the Archdiocese of San Francisco had to close down its adoption agency because it, wouldn't, uh, it was ordered to change its policy and adopt out to gay couples. It wouldn't, so it closed down. Same thing happened in Boston, and the same thing happened to the entire Catholic Bishops' Conference of Illinois. So, you know, that just becomes a way, a mechanism, to make the, the church retreat further and further and further away to continually marginalize it. That's what's going on with Obama's health care plan with the contraception thing. Marginalize, push back, shove back here. And the church is scoring no victories anywhere. There's no legislative victories. There's no moral victories. There's nothing. Those have to emerge from us. So, you know, in America, we'd say it's the fourth quarter and you're down 49 to nothing. Now get the ball and go win the game. Michael, we do have uh, some of those uh, uh, provisions in law at the moment, uh, protecting our religious rights, protecting our schools to um, uh, hire according to their religious principles. So, but it, it's, still a, it's still at risk here too, as well. Yeah. Uh, law... I don't have to tell you, laws change. Uh, and secondly, in Canada, for example, uh, in the um, province of Ontario, the Ontario province has a special relationship, church and state. The, uh, it's kind of like a few setups in Europe, but the state uh, has control, loosely has control of the Catholic education system. So they said that the state told the Catholic education system in all of the dioceses in the, Providence, the province of Ontario, you will teach this you know, pro-homosexual agenda in the schools. You will do this. And they did. And that just happened last year. So now the textbooks are coming out with, you know, here's, you know, mommy and daddy, or mommy and mommy, or daddy and daddy. And I suppose in two or three years, why can't they say here's daddy, daddy, and daddy? So uh, uh, this is already going on. All the, all the little jigsaw puzzle pieces are all being kind of put in order. And since it's the diabolical behind this, and since the diabolical's only goal is the destruction of the church, that's it. It's all Satan cares about. Because so once he's got that, he thinks, he'll never get it, but he may have better times than others, but uh, he'll never get it completely. But as he pursues that, that's it. He gets the church out of the way and he has the entire world. So uh, that's what's going on. We have to really be, wow, this is, this is the, all the marbles. Oh, yeah. This is all the marbles. I just want to say thanks for coming down and, and doing the talk today, first of all. Um, you said a lot of things about uh, Pope Francis, and uh, I, I guess we, none of us have really had enough time to really get to know him. I mean, a lot of us knew Cardinal Ratzinger long before he became Pope, and so we rejoiced the day that he was elected, you know, I remember running around the house, but 
Um, a lot of us don't know much about Pope Francis prior to his election. And to sort of segue that into what you were just saying about us being in a situation where we're looking at civilizational exhaustion, a civilization that has walked away from God and is on the verge of collapse, and what does that mean for us? I get the feeling that you know our church is smaller, but at the same time, we can't afford this liberal modernist nonsense that's causing trouble for us within this smaller Catholic community. We need to be a lean, mean Catholic machine at this point in salvation history. And my instinct is that Pope Francis is preparing to take off the gloves with regards to the modernists. And I just wonder if you have any instincts on that at all. I, I, I tend to agree with that assessment. Uh, the fact that he got around, just that one, that's why I kind of highlighted it, the thing that, that he did with the American nuns, that something like that would jump up to the, you know, sort of the top of his list so soon, that's really very, I was like, whoa, I read it and I thought, wow, am I reading something wrong here? Let me go through and read, let me read four or five different accounts of this, and they all agreed, and they said the same. So, yeah, I think so. I think another thing to remember also is that, uh, I mean, that's a very fair point. Many of us knew much about Ratzinger. He was all over, you know, press. He was, you know, he, you know, he was very big. Every time he said anything, it got all over the United States because of the, that constant tension and war uh, in the church in America, which I'm sure you have here. Um, he... Uh, we knew an awful lot about him, so what we do know about uh, Francis during his time as just, you know, Cardinal Bergoglio, Archbishop Bergoglio even, uh, is that when he was uh, uh, in charge of the Jesuits, uh, they did not like him in Argentina. He was really kind of the, the benchmark for orthodoxy and they were constantly assailing him. Uh, he did an awful lot to kind of, not necessarily stamp out, because that came from the Vatican, but uh, to be in concert with the Vatican's effort to rid the, uh, uh, his particular purview of liberation theology. So uh, I know a lot of people, <laughs> when he stepped out onto the balcony, and they're like, oh, this is it. And then the second he said, the, the commentators said Jesuit, a bunch of people went, oh, what? <laughs> but uh, he has had those battles uh, within the Jesuit order. And I think that's good. So yes, I, I, you know, I think that he has, it is just a hunch. It's not, I shouldn't say it's just a hunch. It is largely a hunch, but it's kind of backed up by these little, things I see, and I don't really see anything to contradict those. It's not like he's come out and said, even this business about him supporting gay civil unions uh, while he was in Argentina is kind of a, a you know, a, a, a slowdown of the gay marriage thing, same-sex marriage thing. He, uh, <clears throat> uh, somebody came out and told the Associated Press, that's total garbage. He was never in favor of same-sex civil unions as a political decoy against same-sex marriage. So, um, you know, do these things come up in conversations? Well, they're having conversations about it in the Vatican. Uh, uh, Cardinal Schoenberg just said something. Cardinal Marini just said something uh, about, well, you know, you kind of have to wonder how do you deal with, I mean, they're all kind of wondering. You know, a, a very good thing would be for these, you know, uh, church leaders to shut up in the secular media, you know, why do you have to take your wonderings and your ideas and maybe this and maybe that and go blab them to the media? You know, have the discussions if you want amongst yourselves, see how they square with the magisterium and the tradition of the church, and then just go on about your business. I, the, the constant churning over of this stuff in the secular media, it, it, it makes me think that there are many of these men who are bishops and cardinals are either massively naive, which they could be, <clears throat> or they're trying to advance an agenda uh, where some of this stuff is accepted. 
but to continually say things in the media constantly to the secular media and be granting these interviews all the time. I've worked in that business for 20 years. It is about as anti-Christ as you can imagine. They cheer on uh, abortion. The largest uh, trade association in the United States, uh, television, radio, electronic, media, they have all kinds of like, you know, they have like the black journalists group and the, this group and that group. The largest by far is the Gay and Lesbian Journalist Association. So why they don't know these things or why their handlers or secretaries or whoever it is don't know these kinds of things, I, I, I don't know. I really don't know. So I, I, one of the very first things I would do if I was helping a bishop or a cardinal would say, don't say anything to the secular media that you don't need to say. And when you say something, it should be the church's teaching and that's it. You don't need to go into the rationale for it. You don't need to go into what the other wonderings might be. Maybe we could do this. Maybe we could do that. Because that's what they pick up and run with. So I haven't seen anything in the secular media that would suggest uh, that Pope Francis is not everything as some of these quotes that I read. And if he had said something, it seems like we would hear about it. And I haven't seen it. I've been on the road a little bit. Maybe he said, we don't know if Jesus is divine or not, but I, I haven't read that. <laughs> uh, Michael, we would like to thank you very sincerely for sharing with us uh, your wisdom and your faith and your knowledge and understanding that comes with that. And uh, look, a lot of the critiques, I know Michael said on the vortex uh, of, uh, of people who are orthodox, is, uh, and particularly in uh, this day and age, is... Um, you know, too much clarity, not enough charity. But I think with Michael, you get the clarity that actually leads us to understand and practice true charity. Um, you can't have really one without the other. Um, so uh, thank you very much for coming tonight and for helping uh, to um, us all to understand the way that the media is, uh, does try to work against the church, as so many of them do, but also giving us hope that... Um, we know the gates of hell won't prevail and that Pope uh, Francis will be, still be a wonderful pontiff and holy father for us all and we will continue to pray for him and, and to pray for you. So thank you for that. Thank you to everyone here for coming uh, and uh, to the students as well. There's no school tomorrow so um, you don't have to come back here then. You've got another week. And uh, to all the Reverend Fathers, to the sisters um, for your support. Um, and as David Abed would say, God speed you all home. Thank you.